Hello, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Welcome to CGR Fighter Sanitary Awareness Week. We are very pleased to organize uh, the Germplasm Health webinar series on the occasion of our uh, Fighter Sanitary Awareness Week, which is planned from 9th to 13th November 2020, which will be a week long event starting today, going all the way to Monday. We are holding this event on the occasion of International Year of Plant Health. And one of our objectives is to broadly disseminate the Germplasm Health mission to both partners, our stakeholders, and all other beneficiaries of the GHU work. In this particular event today, we've mainly focused on three key seminars to be delivered by international experts. We call today as a kind of a global plenary as a start for this webinar week. I provide a brief introduction before inviting speakers to uh, make their presentations. Firstly, I would like to mention, we have been very well sensitized about the COVID-19 impact on the human. There are a lot of messaging going on in both in mainstream media as well as in social media starting from the outbreak that was recognized first in China and then in the rest of the world. All these messages mainly focusing on preventing getting infected from COVID-19. There are a lot of ways how this can be done and this messaging is coming from health workers, policy makers, government officials, and many other actors. And this kind of situation is not only unique to the humans and there are a lot of situations where plant also go through a similar kind of situation to avoid getting infected by the pathogens. The reason being that pathogens can also spread just like the way COVID has spread across the world and can cause devastating uh, damage to the crops and native biodiversity. Here I have given some examples of the damages caused by the introduced pests. For example, maize lethal necrosis, which was thought to have been introduced from East Asia to East Africa. And in East Africa, it has caused a major regional epidemic starting in 2011. And another example is wheat blast. It was a native pathogen in Latin America, was recognized four years ago in uh, Bangladesh, in Asia, and very recently in Zambia and Africa. Fusarium wilt tropical race four. This pest was thought to have been introduced from uh, Southeast Asia into Mozambique in Africa, and later on it was recognized in Colombia and Latin America. Fall army worm, thought to have been introduced from Americas to Africa, and then it has spread to Asia and caused a major pandemic. Kasawa mosaic is a virus introduced from South Asia to East Asia, where it caused a regional uh, epidemic. Potato purple top in Ecuador is a more recent example. It's caused by an introduced uh, pathogen. Potato cyst nematode outbreak in uh, Kenya and Uganda, which uh, this nematode is thought to have been introduced from uh, uh, Europe. And there are many other examples where the introduced pathogens have become very much established, like banana bunch of taro blight, papaya mealybug, tuta absoluta, all of them in Africa. Those are the examples where the diseases have known to have caused a major epidemic. And there are many unreported crop pests and pathogens that have been already introduced in many other countries, but they are yet to get recognized. And the reason being that they are neither not caused major epidemic or they are unnoticed for some other reasons. And this is called as a kind of pseudo absence. A modeling study predicts occurrence of several unreported alien pest species. So in this map, the deep purple color means the more number of uh, unrecognized pathogens. The lighter color means less number of pathogens. As you can see, almost in all, all the countries, they're expected to be at least at an average 20 unrecognized pathogens, which have been introduced, but yet to be recognized. Thanks to some of the new technologies such as next generation sequencing, uh, some of these pathogens are being recognized. For example, two examples that I put on the slide includes maize yellow mosaic virus, which was recognized when we are looking for maize lethal necrosis. And then YAM virus Y, which is a virus that causes asymptomatic infection. Both these viruses are now recognized to be widely distributed in maize and yam production areas. And these are not just alone. There are many native pest species that are considered invasive risk 
to other countries. That means if you are not careful, it's very likely that some of the native pests could move to other countries where they are perceived as a major threat. So this is the data coming from uh, uh, a publication that was recently, uh, the recent publication uh, based on the CABI uh, data. It shows number of pests that have been unintentionally imported or exported through the human activities, through shipping and other trade routes and all kinds of activities. This is quite a busy distribution where the pests have been moving across to different continents through various shipping modes and the ships by far I mean, it seems to be the major contributor followed by horticulture trade where the live planting material or cut flowers or fruits and vegetables are exchanged. Why this is important for CGIAR? Because highest amount of germplasm is being distributed from CGIAR centers. Almost 85% of the recorded distributions are officially from CGIAR programs. Annually, CGIAR programs, both from breeding and gene banks, contribute to more than 2,000 requests per year, reaching to 100 countries at least. And this material is distributed in the form of seed, vegetably propagated material, as well as um, in vitro and uh, rooted plants. And this includes both land races, breeding lines, improved varieties, and white relatives. Before I give further details, uh, for those who have joined newly um, uh, or new to this CG system, just as an introduction, CG is a global agriculture organization which has 15 centers spread across the world. 11 of these centers focus on crop improvement programs, and they have uh, gene banks and breeding programs, all of which focused on very important food staples. And the major goal of uh, CGR is to enhance the genetic gains, protect plants, protect environment, contribute to climate adaptation, and create opportunities for gender, youth, and in, by social equity, and also improve the partner's capacity. Ultimately, all this address UN Sustainable Development Goals. CGR also hosts gene banks, which have the largest collection, exceeding 750,000 accessions, corresponding to over 200 genera. This is one of the most diverse collections of important food, forage, and tree germplasm, which are exchanged in the form of seed, in vitro material, or vegetative propagatory material, all of which pose a significant risk for pest distribution if adequate care is not taken. And this is a major concern because CG distributes material from their gene banks to almost all parts of the world. If adequate care is not taken, pest can spread up very easily with this planting material contributing to pest distribution with germplasm. And uh, as you could see on this map, this is a network of international distribution from the CG center. It is not an airline map. This is just from the gene banks. And if you overlay the data from the breeding programs, this network would get much more thicker. As you could see, the germplasm is moving from 11 CG centers to almost all parts of the world. And why is it it's, it's a concern? Because a number of countries where CG programs are located, our partners are performing very important research. They have very limited phytosanitary capacity. As you could see in this map, based on the study done, published in 2016, the capacity, the proactive capacity to prevent pest outbreaks is very limited in many parts of the developing countries. Whereas the reactive capacity is somewhat better, but in Sub-Saharan Africa and some of Latin American countries and South Asia, it's very weak. So basically the phytosanitary organizations and national plant health organizations have lim very limited capacity to cope with introduced pest outbreaks. So as a consequence, it becomes a mandate for CG centers to make sure that any germplasm and any bioresources that are distributed from the centers are free from pest and pathogens. So therefore, germplasm health units have been established right from the formation of CG. It has various uh, uh, developmental stages, but in 1990, uh, germplasm health units have been established as a independent units within the centers to ensure adequate measures are taken to reduce the risk of pest spread with germplasm exchange. And centers use standardized procedures for handling seed and plant health in uh, different countries and comply with IPPC and the national plant production procedures. The GHU mission has primarily six focus areas. 
one of the areas is on diagnostic to develop diagnostic tools for ascertaining plant health. Develop procedures, phytosanitary procedures to eliminate pests and pathogens and develop clean planting material for propagation and distribution. Ensure regulatory compliance. This is to comply with all the national and international procedures for any material that is exchanged from the CGR centers. Perform pest risk assessment at a, together with the national programs to assess the extent of introduced pests or native spread risk to uh, native pests that can pose a risk to germplasm. And see, GHUs also may maintain a community of practice, which is a network of both GHU practitioners within CJR as well as partners where we operate. The whole idea of having community of practice is to exchange best practices, knowledge, and help capacity development. And see, GHUs focus very heavily on capacity development, especially training partners to develop skills in pest diagnostics and generation of clean planting material. GHUs contribute to all areas that involves movement of germplasm, right from the collections to conservation, seed regeneration, and distribution. So almost all these activities, when it comes to the health, it is the GHUs that perform and certify the planting material uh, health status and the material that is free from pests and diseases are distributed. So the primary mission of GHUs is to prevent the spread of to prevent the transboundary spread of pathogens through germplasm, ensure CGR compliance to phytosanitary regulations, and enable CGR impact by serving as a conduit to deliver international commitments. So as you could see in this diagram, these GHUs are located strategically across all parts of the world, and they have a huge partnerships, and together they make up a, a fantastic global network. One of the tasks that GHU performs annually is to organize Phytosanitary Awareness Week. The purpose is to raise awareness, undertake advocacy in favor of policies for uh, reasonable policies for support in support of uh, germplasm exchange and outreach to showcase the various activities that are undertaken by GHUs to ensure the health of the germplasm that is distributed to the partners and also contribute to the capacity development. So we undertake this under kind of a four key objectives, inform, update, inspire, and engage. So this year, coinciding with International Year of Plant Health, we are focusing the Phytosanitary Awareness Week on the topic, Phytosanitary Safety for Transboundary Pest Prevention. As part of this event, we are planning, we, hold, we are holding this webinar series every day, two hours, starting from Monday to Friday. Each day focuses on a different themes. Today, it will be on global plenary, it's a kind of an inception. Tomorrow session, which is focused on Asia, the issues in Asia. On Wednesday, the focus is on the phytosanitary issues in Latin America. On Thursday, the focus is on the phytosanitary challenges in Africa. And we conclude the webinar series with a global plenary once again, with summaries coming from each of these sessions and a panel discussion to develop a kind of a a way, of, way forward plan, recommendations and way forward plan. Today, in the global plenary, we have three renowned speakers who will be each, each giving a keynote address. This session will start with a presentation from Dr. Zia, who is the director, plant production and production division FAO, Rome, Italy. He will be talking on delivery of the International Year of Plant Health and the way forward. This presentation will be followed by Dr. Eddie Freeman's keynote address. Dr. Eddie Freeman is a regional program leader of FAO Regional Office for Africa, located in Accra, Ghana. He would talk about FAO CGR partnerships for transboundary plant pest prevention and management in Africa. And the final presentation will be delivered by Dr. Charlotte Lusty, who is the head of the program, coordinator of the CGR Gene Bank Platform, Global Crop Diversity Trust, Bonn, Germany. Dr. Lusty will talk on the global system of gene banks and the vital role of the CGR phytosanitary program. I hope the participants would benefit from the knowledge that is shared through these webinars today and the next five days. We are making this, uh, these webinars as an open access and they have been conveniently timed for global participation. So with that, 
I will start inviting Dr. Zia to make his first presentation. Thank you. Working with my slides? Yeah, we can see your slides. Okay, great. Thank you, Chair, for your kind invitation and also excellent introduction. And also take this opportunity. I would like to express my thanks to your institute. In fact, last year is lucky, I was lucky, have a chance to visit your institute. And last time we have, uh, we organized an IPPC Regional Plant Protection Organization Director Meeting in, your, in uh, Nigeria. So it's very good, it gave me very good impression. And thank you very much and for your hospitality for last year. Okay, for my presentation, I just make some introduction about the IYPH, International Year of Plant Hills. And everybody know that. And the plant hills is very important because plants are the basis of the life, making 80% of our diet and 98% of oxygen we are breathing. So, plant, uh, so protect plant hills is a fundamental for achieving UN SDGs because plant pests and the disease causes up to 40% of losses of a global food crop and also resulting economic losses about 220 billion in the trade for agricultural products, products. So because this is the importance, so that's why, and through many, many generations, and our people work on it for International Year of Plant Hills. So this is the year for International Year of Plant Hills for 2020. So what is the overall objective of the IYPH? It's to raise awareness of public and political decision maker at the global, regional, and the national level about how important plant health contribution to achieving UN SDG. In particular, this seven UN SDG is very important. And the seven USDG go, USDGs and the four important category, and like reducing poverty, ending hunger, and protecting environment, boosting trade, safe trade and economic development. Oh, what is the history of IVIPH? We can say we make this IVIPH preparation for five years. In 2015, this initiative was proposed by Finnish government at the CPM team. 2016, approved by FAO Council. 2017, adopted by FAO Conference. And 2018, is proclaimed by UN General Assembly. So General Assembly requests FAO in collaboration with IPPC to lead the implementation of the IYPH. And now what is IYPH global governance to make this happen? And then the FAO and IPPC, we organized established IYPH International Steering Committee and this committee provide overall guidance and action plan and organize the overall different meeting and activity. And this committee, we have one IVPH secretary composed of staff from FAO and also IPPC secretary to provide support and also promote implementation of this activity. What is the key activity so far for IVIPH? And the first one is the opening. This took place in December, for, as December 2nd. 
and the 2019 last year, December, during the FEO Council meeting. And later on, you can see a lot of key activity or the question mark because of influence by COVID-19. And we supposed to have high level, a high level platform forum launching in 2027 in UN, we failed to do it. And during the World Food Day in October 16 this year, we cannot do it. And all the CPM 15 this year with a ministerial segment and that should take place in this March, we cannot do it, make it. And then it's COAC and the COPS 15, everybody know that for biodiversity and it should be in this year in October in China, we can do it. And very importantly, we have a remark, we have planned in the first international plant health conference to be take place in Helsinki in this year, October. Also, we can do it. You can see COVID-19 has a very big impact. I can say a negative impact about IYPH. Even though, and we try all our best to make it happen as much as possible and using as possible the tour, particularly for virtual activity. Look, like IVPH launch events, this is for last year, our DG make announcement. And then our DG even mentioned also human and animal health prevention, plant health is better than cure. Much still need to be done for secure plant health. So through so this year, COVID-19, we can say this statement is so correct, it's so important. Now, this year we have a global activity, it's mainly for advocacy. Now we have our logo with a different language. And now we have a 32 language, and a 32 language, six UN language, and the 26 others language available of our logo for IVIPH. And then for digital social media campaign, and this year because of this COVID-19, a lot of activity we work on the virtual. And then of course, social media play a very important role to advocacy of this important events. Now also we organize some story for FEO IPPC website. And this story we can see IPPC hero or plant protection hero in the world. Now we make the story on the both website. And so people can share in their story. And then also we have IYPH ambassador and we select five regional, every original MPPC and IVIPH ambassador. And just for example, for European country, IVIPH ambassador. And this is the round golden designer. And the, this is every region we have FEO special goodwill ambassador for every five and FEO region. And then the regional core activity is main on IVIPH. And there is a tour channel organized this kind of activity. IPPC, RPPO means regional plant protection organization take the lead in organizing regional activity. Men is role organizing, holding, organizing regional meeting workshop, make coordination regional exhibition and initiative and also developing original communication material. There is another channel, FEO regional office, they organize the side events. However, because of COVID-19, this year, no side events. However, we share every information paper at each of the regional conference take place in this year. And then let's just give you an example about the North African region organized regional activity to show IVIPH, to advocacy of IVIPH. 
Now it's national level, I think the main activity in the national level. And then now we have three country mint the coin, Italy, Belgium, and the Mexico, you can say different value, the coin, the type of coin. We have a bag, badge, and then and the train, like me then, there's a train, is the advocacy, and also some bus. But the most importantly now, we have over 20 country issued official stamp for a souvenir for IVPH. Now what is, because of COVID-19, so it's important activity and then prolong it to the next year. I want the mission to please be patient and to be actively participant. Number one, CPM 15 with a mysterious segment to be organized in March 2021. I can say now virtually. And this will be biggest events for celebration of the IVIPH. And then the first international conference on Plum Hills to be organized in Helsinki in June 2021. And the together, the close ceremony of IVIPH will be together at the end of the first international conference on Plant Hills and to be organized in Hill Thinking. This means close ceremony and same time also for close of the first international conference in Hill Thinking. And so far we still planning face to face, but maybe also we need a virtual. Let's wait and see. Now, what is the key outcome of IVIPH? Through many years preparation, we hope through celebration, delivery of the IVIPH, the four important output. The first output, raising awareness of importance of Plant Hills by public in contribution to UN SDG worldwide. And I already mentioned Plant Hills and the support and the key, uh, uh, the key contribution to seven UN SDGs. And then covering about the food security, poverty, environment protection, and economic development and the trade. Second one is promote a promotion of a knowledge research, academia, partnership on Plant Hills and the relational, regional and global level. Like this today's meeting is really organized by IITA. It's really, you know, how can the research and partnership knowledge people work together to support Plant Hills, to promote Plant Hills knowledge. And the number three, recognition of the importance of plant health by citizen, particularly by public. And then when you travel, make something, please make sure don't bring some you know, alive plant, plants and with you in case there is a risk to bring new pests and the disease to the new area. So I think like this year in so many airport, the bus, transportation, have this kind of video message very clear to show and in a warning the people to uh, when planning the travel, please take care of, make sure it's not to bring any and uh, plant heals risk to the other country. And the lastly, however, is most importantly to establish International Day of Plant Hills. I can say this is excellent news. I can tell you, share your friends. Now, there is International Day of Plant Hills have already been worked out. The like initiative is the most is first proposed by Zambia government. Now, in this year, in FEO COAG Agriculture Committee COAG Committee meeting already endorsed this initiative. And every year we're planning, every year May 12th will be International Day of Plant Hills to celebrate. Now, next step, we're going to have this initiative to be endorsed by and 
FEO Council meeting at the end of this year. And if a council meeting endorsed this initiative, and then we should submit for endorsement for FEO conference next June, 2021 June. After endorsement for FEO conference, and we should submit to UN General Assembly. This means by the end of next year, we can make this if General Assembly agreed and and endorse. This means start from 2022, May 12th, we can have our first celebration, International Day of Plant Hills. I hope everybody, particularly for and the Plant Hills community, let's work together because we still have a long way to reaching the goal, you know, uh, the final and the proclamation by UN SDG. So during the process, and uh, we hope all the research, researcher, academia, and the regulation governing body and the country government, and then support this initiative to make sure to be improved and approved by FEO Council uh, and conference and then UN General Assembly. So this will be very important for the last, you know, because I will pitch on only once a lifetime opportunity. However, IDPH will be every year we have a chance to celebrate. So this will be very big events. And also it's breaking news. I want to share with everybody. Let's work together to make it happen. Okay, what can I, you, we do for contribution? This is a lifetime opportunity, particularly we can contribute to IDPH. So please use and share the IVPH logo and the material. Secondly, promote the photo context and the art and the drawing competition. Now we are still in the process organize the photo contest. And number three, be sure, be active, you know, for on social media and use every approach we can. Number four, support IVPG legacy. I already mentioned about proclamation of IDPH. And lastly, please work actively as IVPH champion, spokesman, ambassador, influencer, and every, you know, even in the beyond of 2020. Thank you very much again for your kind invitation. I hope let's work together to continuously delivery of IVPH and be prepared for celebration IDPH every year. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Zia, for this very nice presentation and uh, clearly explaining the International Day of Plant Health concept, how it originated, what are the current activities and the future of it. It's very clear and I'm very glad to hear about the International Day each year, which we could celebrate to highlight the importance of plant health. Um, we ask if anybody have a question or clarification to raise hand so that admin can let you in. Um, I have one question. Could you explain to us about the extension of International Year of Plant Health to 2021? Uh, and also the International IVPH Conference in uh, of Helsinki, Finland. Is it the culmination end of the official end of the IVPH next year? Uh, what are the plans from now to the, the end of the program next year? Okay, thank you, Chair. And uh, I will answer your question now. Also, I mentioned in my uh, presentation because influenced by uh, COVID-19, a uh, three major activity we postponed next year. And number one, we could say PM 15. In fact, this year we say CPM 15, unfortunately we cannot do it. So we can say CPM 15 and still with the ministerial segment together. 
if a ministerial segment there is some declaration declaration there so this will be take place in march of next year so this means at least extend to this march and then second important activity will be and the international con first international conference mm -hmm. And in the Helsinki, and this will be the end of July, and also early uh, end of June, early of July. I remember it's a lot July first, maybe, and also it's a close ceremony of IVPH. So even in this case, this means we can at least the three major milestone activity will be extended to 2021 July. And before this time, I think still if you have some activity initiative for celebration, we are encouraged to do it, no problem, yeah? This is the whole idea, yeah. Thank you very much. This is very clear. Thanks for this clarification. Um, we ha I haven't seen any hands raising so it looks like your presentation is very clear. Uh, and it's also the time for the next speaker. You're right on time, although I have consumed more at the beginning uh, because of the, the challenges I had with uh, moving slides here for some reasons. Um, but anyway, uh, I once again thank you for your excellent presentation. And then we move on to the second presentation of today, which is going to be delivered by Dr. Adi Freeman. Dr. Adi Freeman is a regional program leader for FAO Regional Office for Africa, located in uh, Accra, Ghana. Adi provides management and leadership for strategic planning, formulation, execution, monitoring, and reporting of FAO program of Africa, FAO program of work in Africa. He also supports FAO Assistant Director General regional representative in collaboration with FAO representatives in engaging member governments in formulating the formulating and implementing the organization's work in response to regional priorities within the context of FAO's strategic outcomes. He worked extensively in research and senior management positions in four international agriculture research centers within the consultative group for international agriculture research. So he is very familiar with CG system. He holds a PhD in applied economics from University of Minnesota. So welcome Dr. Adi Freeman and uh, you have your time now. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Thank you so much and um, colleagues from the CJR and partner institutions. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. This is a global event. So I presume we're covering all time zones um, in this event. It is my pleasure on behalf of my colleagues, FEO, the regional representative in the regional office in Africa, and of course, FEO DG, to speak to you at this phytosanitary safety for transboundary pest prevention webinar that is organized by the germplasm health units of the CJR. As the chair mentioned, I started my career in the CJR. I started my <laughs> professional career at ITA many years ago. So I'm personally very thrilled to be at any CGIR event, but also because of a firm conviction of the payoffs to investing in the CGIR. As a matter of fact, a recent study showed that over the past five decades, the CGIR has spent about $60 billion in present value terms. And this investment, mainly through its contributions to enhancing yields of staple food crops, has returned tenfold benefits that is manifested as greater food abundance, cheaper food, reduced rates of hunger and poverty, and a smaller geographical footprint of agriculture. These are indeed significant benefits, and it doesn't even count the substantial benefits that accrue in high income countries. So the CGI, investing in the CGI, I think that's the first point that I think I want to make in this in these remarks, has been a significant, has had significant payoffs, investment in, in international public goods and um, very few um, activities or investments compared to the investment in the CJR. Therefore, this webinar is very timely. Indeed, to, be, to raise awareness about the CJR's Jamplasm Health Unit's missions and functions among partners and stakeholders. Plant pests and diseases have threatened farmers for millennia. 
causing substantial crop losses, both before and after harvest, and reducing availability and access to food. As Dr. Zia reminded us, it is estimated that up to 40% of global food crops are lost annually due to plant pests. And also he gave us some of the figures that when we translate this into economic terms, plant disease cost the global economy around $220 billion annually and invasive insects around 70 billion. These are indeed significant losses that we should do more to, to avoid. This loss leaves millions of people without enough food to eat, has a negative impact on poor, rural poor communities, the main source of income, and results in both yield and trade losses. These are translated into negative impacts on achieving the sustainable development goals, as also Dr. Zia reminded us, particularly SDG 1 and 2 that are aimed at eliminating hunger and malnutrition and reducing poverty and threats to the environment. Transboundary pests, plant pests and disease are raising public awareness due to the potentially huge impact on food security, human livelihoods, human health, livelihoods, and trade. As a matter of fact, recent estimates from the State of Food Security and Nutrition in the world, SOFI, a flagship FAO publication, which this year was um, uh, um, produced with um, partners from other UN agencies, estimates that in 2019, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, almost 690 million people globally were undernourished. The report also shows that if current trends continue, the number of undernourished people will exceed 840 million globally by 2030. And as a result of this, the world definitely is not on track to achieve zero hunger, even without the negative effects that COVID-19 will have on hunger. So we're way really off track in achieving the SDGs, particularly one and two. We all know, and uh, this, this, this webinar is a testimony to that in, in, in another dimension, that COVID-19 has made the global food security situation worse, with the pandemic estimated to add about 83 to 132 million people to the ranks of the undernourished in 2020. The report also tells us that over 3 billion people globally cannot afford the cheapest healthy diets. Colleagues, the global food situation is worrisome, and the situation may get worse if we do not act urgently and take decisive actions. And it is within this context that we would like to see um, the collaboration between FAO and the CGIR. We all know that the spread of transplanted disease has increased dramatically in recent years due to rapidly increasing transboundary movements of goods and people and changing climate. Transboundary pests pose the greatest immediate threat when they move as plagues or when they're introduced for the first time into ecologically favorable conditions where there are few natural factors to limit their spread and people do not have the experience in managing them. Such occurrences often have the most evident economic impact and in many cases affect marginalized people most severely. The impact of transboundary pests is especially high in sub-Saharan Africa, where they affect major food and nutritional security crops like cassava, maize, banana, plantain, yam, taro, and horticultural crops. Recently, we have seen the effects of the ongoing desert locust in the Horn of Africa, the fall army worm, and the fruit fly, cassava, brown streak, maize, lethal necrosis, banana, bunch top, etc. For example, the desert locust invasion in East Africa threatened food security in this region, resulting in billions of dollars in crop and livestock losses, reduced harvest, and limited availability of food in formal and informal markets. In 2020, transboundary pests and disease, in particular, the desert locust and Africa migratory red locust outbreaks in East and Southern Africa aggravated the effects of COVID-19 pandemic exacerbating the deteriorating food security situation in Africa. Efforts to control these problems are fragmented and actions tend to be limited to some regions which allow epidemics to persist. In addition to this, poor adoption of control measures, limited capacity for early and accurate detection and inadequate regulatory and phytosanitary management measures across Africa 
prevent an opportunity for rapid response. There is an urgent need to strengthen the capacity of national, regional, and global plant health institutions to prevent entry and spread of transboundary pest diseases. This can be achieved through partnerships for development and implementation of regional frameworks with specific prevention and control strategies. FEO, as Dr. Zia mentioned, and, 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 and some of you know, has been working in this area for, 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 for a long time. And there are a number of interventions that to address transboundary pest disease and, and, and pest disease that FEO is working on. The first line of defense is the implementation of the International Plant Protection Convention. Its secretariat is hosted by FAO, and it, this organization coordinates actions against the introduction and spread of plant pests and diseases with the collaboration of the regional plant protection organization and national plant protection organizations. It is important to note that the IPPC is recognized by the World Trade Organization's Agreement on Sanitary and Phytosanitary Measures as the standard setting organization for plant health. Moreover, FEO established the Emergency Provision Prevention System for Transboundary Animal and Plant Pests and Diseases, Empress, in 1994, with the goal of achieving world food security and fighting transboundary animal and plant pests and diseases to streamline FEO processes for the prevention and management of crisis along the food chain. The Food Chain Crisis Management Framework, FCC, was created in 2008. The FCC integrates prevention and preparedness to emerging threats to the food chain, long-term risk analysis, risk communication, and rapid, medium, and longer-term responses to potential or verified emergencies threatening the food chain. For the desert locust in particular, the FAO Desert Locust Information Service, the LIS, operates the Nali warning system to monitor weather, ecological conditions, and locust infestation on a daily basis since 1978. It is the global focal point and clearinghouse for all locust and locust related survey and control data, which are analyzed to produce monthly bulletins, six week forecasts, alerts, and warnings. FAO and IPPC have therefore taken the lead to support countries in, in addressing the transboundary pest challenges, promoting the implementation of international standards to prevent pests from being introduced and to control established pests through integrated pest management practices. As I mentioned, FAO has a, a, a track record of, of, of part, partnerships with the, with the CGIR. And like I said, this goes all way back. FAO has a long history of collaboration with the CGIR. And we are always looking for opportunities to discuss how we can work more closely together on issues of common interest. Partnerships between FAOR, FAO and the CGIR Centers for Prevention and Management of Transparent Pests has played a key role in most cases where there are outbreaks. For example, we have had successful partnerships including the following. ITA collaborated with FAO on the banana bacterial wilt control initiative in Uganda. FAO has worked with ICADA, CIMIT, and the Global Rust Initiative to conduct for information, to share information and capacity building activities on management strategies for the prevention and control of UG99, a virulent race of the wheat stem rust. ITA and ICPE have collaborated with FAO Desert Locust programs in developing and testing biopesticides for desert locust control in Africa. ITA collaborated with FAO in biological control of papaya millibug in West Africa. And FAO through its regional cassava initiative collaborated with ITA and the Great Lakes Cassava Initiative in management of cassava mosaic disease and cassava brown sticks disease in the Great Lakes of African countries. More recently, FAO has collaborated with CIMIT, IITA, ICRISAT, and various other organizations for coordinated sustainable management of fall armyworm. These are just examples of, of work that we have done together. But going ahead, um, we envisage continued and very strong partnership 
between FAO and the CGI centers, whose role in research for development is key for prevention and management of transboundary pest plant diseases. In general, FAO would help to upscale and apply research results obtained by, that are led by research programs in the CGIR. More specifically, to enhance partnerships, FAO and CGI centers should coordinate the efforts to support surveillance to prevent potential threats before they impact the agricultural sector. This will enable increased preparedness and inform plant protection decision making to better mitigate threats. Various tools developed by FAO and the CJR will be regularly shared and updated, while other tools may be collaboratively developed. Partnerships will also offer an opportunity to synthesize existing knowledge and make it available to practitioners, including decision makers at all levels, and these include regional uh, um, levels as well as some um, national governments that, um, that we work with. There's also a need to develop platforms and create networks for collaboration on developing systems to better collect information, improving the flow of information or data so that it can be used to forecast the likelihood of transparent pests, establishing, assess the consequence of establishment and identify efficient management measures. Some of the ideas for collaboration for response to transboundary pests that we'd like to propose to this meeting include development and dissemination of crowdsource-based tools and digital surveillance systems and analysis of the data collected across countries for a strong monitoring and early warning system. Systematic and large-scale assessment of the present potential socioeconomic impacts of major transboundary plant pests in Africa and the development of forecasting tools to understand potential losses. This might also apply not just to other regions, not just in Africa. Evaluating the impact of ongoing integrated pest management initiatives, developing a strategy for regional coordination of measures to prevent and manage transboundary plant pest threats to food and horticultural crops, and developing joint capacity strengthening programs for African countries, and like I said, by extension to other regions where FU has a presence. This event that is organized in the framework of the International Year of Plant Health 2020 offers an opportunity to emphasize on the importance of safe trade in plants and plant products by complying with international plant health standards and on strengthening monitoring and early warning systems to protect plants and plant health. Let us seize this opportunity to improve phytosanitary capacity for Africa and by extension other regions where FAO has a presence. The current context is also dominated by the COVID-19 pandemic, which we are also familiar with, with its disruptions on various, um, uh, um, uh, well, across <laughs> basically the, the food supply chain. It is clear that transboundary pest-related activities have been affected at all levels, in global, regional, and national levels. However, it is critical to adjust the way of doing business to the new normal and deliver on plant health. As we all know, business as usual is not an option. One of the potential consequences of this global emergency is the possibility of disrupted trade and compromised access to so safe and stable supply of food. Therefore, ensuring safe supply of fresh food and protecting plants from pests is now more important than ever. Resorting to digital solutions offers a possibility that should be exploit, exploited as much as possible. Partnerships with all relevant stakeholders is key. FAO Regional Office for Africa and uh, sub-regional offices are therefore committed to strengthening their collaborative ties with the CJR towards prevention and management of transboundary plant pests. FAO is also committed to renewing the existing memorandum of understanding with the CJR, centers of the CJR, with a strong focus on food systems, innovation, biotechnology, and FAO's new hand in hand initiative, which prioritizes targeted work that benefits people in the world's most vulnerable regions as priority collaboration areas. On behalf of my FAO colleagues, I express my gratitude to the Jamplasm Health Units of the CJR for giving me this opportunity and wish you a productive discussion and fruitful webinar. 
Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ade Freeman, for this excellent keynote presentation. You have touched a number of important aspects. You highlighted the challenges due to pest and diseases to the world food systems and highlighted a loss of nearly 40% produce because of uh, the damage. And also one of the pests, and you also highlighted pests as one of the major contributing factor for food scarcity, especially in the vulnerable uh, regions. Um, you have highlighted a number of a action, future action, and also highlighted gaps. That includes the key points that you highlighted includes insufficient capacity. Um, insufficient regulatory systems and the need for strengthening partnerships between the various plant health organizations. You also strongly recommended the need for upscaling the research results to achieve greater impact and the need for enhancing the partnerships between the relevant organizations focused on the phytosanitary issues. You highlighted the need for surveillance, emergency response, and also the role that digital tools can play in crowdsourcing information for uh, analysis and early warning. And one of the areas that you emphasized is the need for systematic analysis of economic impact of, impact of pests and diseases. This is a major gap and is much desired. And there is some ongoing initiatives on a limited scale, but there is a need for more information here. And also the need for evaluation of impact of the integrated pest management in controlling and mitigating some of the major epidemics caused by pests and diseases. And you highlight the need for developing joint capacity development plans, which I think is very important to avoid duplication and to improve the complementarity between the various efforts that are ongoing the globally. And you highlighted a number of times need for early warning systems to protect the food system. So this is a, a great presentation and um, we invite any questions and points of clarification from the participants. We have about five minutes time left before we move on to the next speaker. Um, I have one, I would like to ask one question. There is a lot of emphasis on the early warning systems, taking the example of both uh, COVID-19 or fall army worm or even locusts. There is sufficient information already in terms of the, the pest risk and how it is moving, etc. But uh, the greatest the need has come from the lack of sufficient capacity to counter this invasive pest. Um, how much you think is a need for uh, stressing on the need for countermeasures, that is the post pest introduction activities to mitigate the impact and mitigate further spread of introduced pests? Because quite often the early warning systems, preparedness gets uh, frequently mentioned as a need but then there is just only one step. What happens in case the pest enters? Thank you very much, um, Lavara. I think um, excellent question. You know, if I, I like I mentioned earlier on, I think we need to really look at the the, the, the challenges as well as the opportunities within a new lens. Um, COVID nineteen has, if nothing. I think it has taught us that when you have disruptions, you know, this sort of scale of disruption shocks to the food system, the impacts go way beyond, you know, the food system itself. It, it impacts practically everything. And that is why I think the approach that we have to take has to be much more an integrated approach. Like you rightly said, yes, there's need for the early warning, the detection, but we need to move beyond that. We need to have a broader perspective. We need to address the countermeasure that you're talking about. And I think it is this sort of integrated perspectives that looks at not just the impact, but also how it affects the resilience of the system, um, 
not now, but five, 10, 15 years, 20 years in the in the future, which is going to be important. So I do agree with you. And I think for us at IFL, we have been used in a one health approach, which really allows us to look at the entire food system, but also to look at different decision periods. The 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 the, the you know prior to, to to the outbreak, when there's an outbreak, but also what happens after the outbreak. And, and like I said earlier on, I think it is these approaches that we all need to work together on to make sure that we have address basically what you say, not just the the, 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 the the diagnostic phase, but also to look at the countermeasures, what happens after the intervention. And, and like I said earlier on, um, my colleagues are here in this meeting, we're going to be, you know, looking forward to, to having these conversations with the CJR and other partners as how we can strengthen these approaches and support our member countries to be able to do a better job of not just um, de um, detecting this, but controlling this to improve um, Profit, productivity, and, 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 and efficiency of the food systems that we work on. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank thank you very much for this clarification. Um, I, one other question that I have is mainly pertaining to the situation in Africa. Uh, uh, in the last ten years, Africa has exposed to a number of introduced pests, which have caused major uh, epidemics, or sometimes have caused regional pandemics. Almost like now we are getting almost every one year, one major pest incidents. Some which are affecting the major food crops are getting noticed and there are a number of other uh, introduced pests which rarely get mentioned. For example, thorough blight is an example, which has caused literally, literally decimated the whole native gem system, if at all any left. So what do you think is need to be done to change the situation? It's become very clear that every time a pest enters into the continent, there is always a delay in identification and then also delay in mounting action. And there are a number of reasons for that. How the status quo can be changed? I know this is a difficult question, but what we need to do differently because over the years of experience, um, not much in terms of uh, changing the scenario is happening. Uh, some, of course, are very difficult challenges, such as locust. But in general, the situation remains uh, very precarious when it comes to managing pests and diseases. What needs to be done? Yeah, I have my colleagues who are experts <laughs> in, in plant pests and diseases. Um, uh, my, dear, my colleague, um, John Bahama, is in this meeting, and I'm sure, John, I will not do justice to this, to this sort of uh, um, um, yeah, um, question. Done. But I know John is here, but I will just give you my thoughts. And I'm sure that these are issues that will be discussed um, in, the, in the coming days and um, probably might add a lot more technical content to, 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 to this. But, you know, I think you, you, you're right. You know, one of the things that we need to do is to be able to better understand the drivers. You know, what is it that is causing, you know, this, this, this sort of um, occurrences, like you said, of, of, of new pests and, uh, and um, that, you know, some of these things didn't exist, but you know, there, there are pressures on the systems, there are pressures on the on the ecosystem, the biophysical systems. There's all all the pressures for a number of reasons, including population growth, urbanization. You know, people are getting to areas where, you know, before we were not there. So that's pressure on the system, and I think we need to be able to better understand those 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 um, drivers. But also, once we understand those, to really improve our product, our, our predictive capacity. And that's the point that I was making earlier on. You know, and and I said so. It's it, it, it needs to go beyond just the, the, the early warning, but we need to be able to predict what um, the likely impacts of, 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 of this pest, imagined pest are. And not just to give a number, but to look at different scenarios, depending on our understanding of the drivers. What are the likely scenarios and how will this play out in terms of, like you rightly said, their economic impact and, and what that means for the lives and livelihoods of the people in, the, in, the, in these areas. So I think we, we need to do that. But, but having done that, we need to go beyond that. Um, and, but, the, 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 you know, we need to have, you know, we need to set priorities. And I think the economic impacts helps us to get a sense of where we should be putting our, our limited research and investment resources. But again, and I hope that um, as during this week, you know, we will spend more time to discuss this. We need to then look at, um, you know, how, how we can engage better in terms of linking the predictive capacity with the research to be able to control this with the development sort of work that FA is doing. But finally, with the investments that are, that, are, that, that are being made by development finance institutions and all that. So I would expect that this sort of conversation is not just 
with the researchers and with the FAO, but to bring in development finance institutions, the likes of the African Development Bank, um, you know, the IFADs, the World Bank, you know, major donors, they have to be at the table so that we can have a clear perspective of what we're going to do and how we're going to, but you know, like I said, these are some of the issues that we think about. And I'm hoping that, um, you know, this is, you know, we have a history of collaboration, but these issues will be very clear on the table. Um, Dr. Zia just mentioned the FAO Regional Conference. We had ours two weeks ago, finished it um, two weeks ago, and the issue of transboundary animal pest and disease is high on the agenda. It's one of our regional priorities. So it is something that we're thinking about all the time. And we will look at opportunities to work with the CGIR and other partners to be able to ask the right questions, but not just the right questions, but to be able to devise solutions that would help us to get to this point. So for us at FU, like I said, you know, it's a priority. Our member countries are asking for it. We're looking at it with the support of Dr. Zia mentioned some of the work that we're doing with the CGIR and others. So I think these are very valid questions and um, we would hope that um, we'll get an opportunity after this to sit down with the partners and come up with an integrated program of work that would help us to address these sort of issues, these questions here, uh, you were asking. But again, like I said, um, Jean and others are in this workshop and I'm sure that you can have a side conversation with them. They'll be very happy to distill this information and help us to see how we can implement the regional priorities for Africa, which includes a focus on transparent pests and diseases. Indeed. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for this clarification. Yes, indeed, there is a need for a greater conversation in terms of the lessons learned from the past epidemics so that the future strategies can actually be slightly different and more effective Absolutely. and address some of the recalcitrant issues so that the interventions can be faster and more effective to contain the spread of introduced pests as well as the native, uh, as well as the outbreaks caused by some of the native pests which are regionalized, but there is a threat that they can also move across the continent, such as Kassau Brown Street. Absolutely. Um, and let me just make one point, sorry, before uh -huh. this, uh, and it's a point that I think was made in, in, in the conversation, you know, and, and I'm, like I said, this is a global, it's a global conference, but in the African perspective, we need to really try to put these things within the context of regional trade. You know, we know that one of the greatest opportunities that Africa has is the African continental free trade area, which gives us tremendous opportunities for trade. And, and, and the issue of plant health, pest and disease is going to be critical for issues of food safety and safe trade. So we also need to put it within that broader context of the opportunities that we see on the continent and how we can address these issues as inputs into ensuring that the benefits of the African continental free trade area are realized by the countries and the region. I just wanted to throw that in there. It's a, I think it's a big part of our trade work too, and I'm sure of the CG and others. Yeah, I think that's a very important point considering this, the agreement between uh, a number of African states on the, the free trade agreement, except for a couple of countries, almost all the countries have signed up to the free trade agreement. Absolutely. Uh, that is an intervention area where policymakers need to be uh, informed and taken on board with regard to the necessary measures to contain the pest spread while the trade is enhancing within the continent. So thank you very much. Unless uh, Bahama wants to do chip in, he, is, he has been unmuted even in case if you want to comment. If not, um, I haven't seen any further questions coming from the, the participants. Um. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Lava. Do you hear me? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. I think that um, uh, Dr. Ade uh, has has said um, uh, what what was uh, very important because we have uh, two aspects that were uh, uh, talked about in the keynote: the prevention. Uh, we need um, uh, to develop and strengthen the capacities for uh, prevention. What, what does that mean? What it means is that we have to have our countries prepared to face uh, the uh, pest and diseases that would uh, enter. It means that we need to uh, put together our effort to uh, uh, develop strategies of uh, studying the pathways 
knowing the looming threats in terms of pests and uh, diseases, and uh, uh, do some uh, contingency planning uh, in case they enter, they find us ready. But we know that the national plant protection organizations are not receiving enough uh, 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 resources to face uh, the challenges uh, of uh, pests and uh, diseases. It's very important that we continue to uh, sensitize and uh, increase awareness of our uh, decision makers, policy makers, that plant health is very important. So we need to be prepared. And so uh, to be prepared, we need to know the pathways. We need to know what is likely to enter our continent, our countries, and uh, we have to uh, prepare well in advance. And once the uh, pest or the disease is declared, we, we are ready to, uh, to control or to manage it or to eradicate it. We'll know where and uh, where we can put more uh, means to, to eradicate when it is possible to eradicate it. But the problem is that all the time, we'll know where it is uh, once it has covered uh, many countries and it is no longer possible to uh, to eradicate it and we have to live with it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Bahama for these comments. <clears throat> yeah, very, very, very good follow up. And then I'm sure we will discuss further when we have a session on uh, focusing on Africa issues on Thursday. Um, with this, um, I would like to thank Dr. Adi Freeman for sharing his insights and uh, excellent keynote presentation. We are very grateful, sir. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. So now uh, we move on to the, the third presentation, third and final presentation of the day. This is going to be delivered by Dr. Charlotte Lusty, who is the head of the program and coordinator of the CGR Gene Bank Platform Global Crop Diversity Trust, Bonn, Germany. Uh, Dr. Lusty is going to talk about the global systems, the global system of gene banks and the vital role of the CGR phytosanitary program. Dr. Lusty, you can share your screen and uh, unmute and you can speak. Thank you. Thank you, Lava. You I hope you slides. can uh, yeah. see my yeah, screen. We can, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Uh, I just uh, tell you that my, my internet is uh, being a little unstable, so I might uh, end up turning off my video. Um, but uh, here I am in life. Uh, many greetings from Germany. Um, and um, thank you very much for inviting me to this, uh, this great event uh, for the International Year of Plant Health. Um, it's a real pleasure to be involved. and. Um, I, I hope I can do some justice uh, to, to, to the event and tell you a bit more uh, from the perspective of, of gene banks. Um, my title is uh, The Global System of Gene Banks and the Vital Role of uh, the CGIR Phytosanitary Program. You'll find that my talk is focused uh, particularly on the, the CGIR gene banks, uh, but there is a great community of gene banks um, at a national, regional, and international level, also um, working down into universities and, uh, and communities. There are many uh, hundreds of gene banks worldwide, um, all uh, functioning under the International uh, Treaty for uh, Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a large community and um, uh, a, a very important um, um, underpinning of future and, and present food security. But what I'm going to focus on in, in this presentation are the CGIER gene banks. Um, Lava touched on these in his uh, introduction. Um, and these are the, uh, the 15 research centers um, focused on um, agriculture through, uh, through the partnership of the CGIR. Um, 11 of the 15 centers have gene banks, and uh, these are on the map here. Um, and uh, their uh, chief role is um, addressing um, the SDG target 2.5 and um, ensuring the long-term conservation and availability 
of uh, crop and tree genetic diversity um, as a public good for the world. Um, this role is very much about uh, addressing current needs, um, dealing with um, present day users and requests, as well as a much longer term uh, need to conserve um, seeds, tissue culture and whole plants safely in order that future generations may also be able to access as much diversity as, as possible in the future. Currently there are um, well over 7, 700,000 um, accessions in these collections um, and uh, most, most of them are seed uh, samples um, kept in um, in long-term storage in, in cold rooms, um, but there is a very sizable uh, tissue culture collection that is managed by the CGIR, as well as whole plants in the field, including tree species. Um, those tissue culture collections, as I'm sure many of you all realize, are particularly those that are for the vegetative propagated crops, uh, potato, sweet potato, cassava, yam, um, in the case of the CGIR. Um, as well as uh, uh, um, several other um, species, um, banana plantain, taro, um, and Andean roots and uh, tuber species. I'm sure I might have forgotten one or two, but uh, they are um, responding to requests coming from all around uh, the world, from uh, different stakeholders, different sectors. Um, in the region of 2000 requests uh, come in annually, um, and result in the distribution of samples, um, sometimes well over 100,000 samples uh, to more than 100 countries uh, worldwide. Um, and, and why is this important? Well, it's very difficult to measure the impact of these gene banks um, and, and, and really each story um, is a, a, a research project in itself. Um, and given that 100,000 samples are going out annually, uh, you can imagine the, the level of uh, impact that we are not tracing. Um, however, here are some examples uh, of a recent uh, impact study. Uh, it was discovered 20% of the improved varieties currently cultivated in a, a rice growing area of Eastern India, um, of, of which over 10 million hectares, had at least one direct parent that um, originated from the gene bank managed by the IRI uh, Rice Institute in the Philippines. And of those varieties, 45% uh, of the composition had come from gene bank accessions uh, when you're looking at the genetics. Um, and a 10% contribution from the gene bank was associated with a 27% rise in yield. So uh, a greater contribution from diversity from gene banks appears to be associated with increasing yields in farmers' fields. Uh, another study was of a popular potato variety uh, in Uganda. Um, the ancestral parents are a uh, wild species and a Peruvian land race um, that came from the SIP gene bank that uh, the, the researcher was able to um, uh, calculate that uh, uh, approximately 72% of the germplasm of this uh, popular uh, variety, Victoria, uh, was based on material from the gene bank in Peru, uh, managed by SIP, and uh, it um, ended up being estimated to be a, a 1.2 billion um, economic gain um, through that uh, use of, of the gene bank. You can get uh, more details of these small impact studies um, at this URL. It's on uh, our webpage, genebanks.org. Um, and uh, it's also been published in a, a recent issue of special issue of food security. So I uh, direct you to there if you'd like more details. Now, the CGIR gene bank platform is um, predominantly focused, as I mentioned, on, on the need for both uh, addressing current needs from users, but also uh, the long-term need for future generations. And that means following um, a, a strict and well-documented process for long-term conservation. Um, seeds don't uh, last forever, in, even in very cold uh, storage. 
they need monitoring, they need uh, bringing out and regenerating and, uh, and, and putting back in storage. And every part of that process involves uh, important phytosanitary controls. Um, so the, the CGIAR gene bank platform has been um, in, in um, being implemented since 2017. And before that, um, we were um, working together in a research program since 2012. And a large part of our work has been in documenting these processes and ensuring that they comply with international standards. Um, the FAO have published uh, gene bank standards, the latest version I think was in 2014, and of course the IPPC and the International Standards for Phytosanitary Measures are also an important part of the, the management of the gene banks and, and how they function. So uh, quality management systems is a core part of, of how we uh, not just uh, document what is actually being done on the ground, but also achieve improvement in the way that the gene banks um, operate. And um, working towards uh, ensuring that all of the seeds and tissue culture and materials in conservation are available for use is also uh, a, a, a very important outcome of, of our uh, nine years uh, functioning together in the platform. Um, and we have set ourselves very high targets. Um, we are expecting that more than 90% of the CGIAR collections are immediately available for distribution. And that means that they have been tested to be viable, there's sufficient seed, and of course, that they are free of uh, pathogens of quarantine risk. So um, this is uh, an essential part of the offer from, from the CGI, our gene bank platform. Um, and not only are they available from um, the CGIR centers, but they are safety duplicated. And in the case of the seed collections, they're safety duplicated twice, uh, once in the Svalbard Global Seed Vault and uh, 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 in, in another uh, host institute that is able to offer the same long-term conditions. Um, documentation of the collections is also essential and, um, and, and the quality management system. Um, so these are the four performance targets that we are aiming for in the CGIR gene bank platform. Um, so far, um, all of the gene banks are, are approaching those targets. Uh, one of them has maintained those targets for several years um, and uh, is offered a long-term partnership agreement with the Crop Trust, which ensures that they are funded uh, in perpetuity forever. Now, under the platform, it's not just a case of ensuring that the routine operations are running smoothly and standards are met, uh, but there is a lot of improvement that we're also aiming for. And that comes through working as communities of practice. And we have a number of areas where we are understanding that technologies or opportunities are available for improvement. Um, and these key areas are in um, uh, cryopreservation and uh, other methods for the, the effective conservation of um, uh, clonally propagated crops. Um, we, we also have uh, expertise in seed quality management that is striving towards uh, improving storage behavior of, uh, of seeds. Um, we also work in gap analysis and in uh, understanding what is inside the collections and where there are gaps. Um, policy is an incredibly important area for us. Uh, we have a dedicated unit that ensures that the CGIR complies with international policy and engages appropriately with uh, policy fora. Data management is an obvious uh, area where uh, continuous improvement is always needed to ensure that we're using the most effective tools in managing the collections as well as ensuring that they are promoted for use and um, of course uh, close to all of our hearts are the germplasm health units in each of the cgir gene banks there is an associated health unit that is working hand in hand with the gene banks to ensure the materials are uh, safe and clean for distribution.
And uh, in this photo on the, the right here, you, you see some of the members of that community of practice working towards uh, uh, germplasm phytosanitary measures. Um, now, why is this important? Because uh, the CGIR gene banks, as, as Lava instructed us in his presentation, have a massive role in the movement of germplasm around the world. And these are the figures since uh, 2012. As uh, you're probably aware, demand changes radically from year to year, and we can never totally predict how much will be uh, needed in any one year with peaks and dips as um, projects begin and end. Um, what does seem to be clear is that the, the, the uh, requirements of, for germplasm outside of the CGIR, which is here depicted in the dark blue columns, is fairly steady. And if anything, um, it's uh, turning out to be greater than the demand uh, from within the CGIR, which is here in the green columns, um, which means that uh, the gene banks have to be uh, ready for, for that distribution whenever it is uh, required. Um, the distribution internationally is uh, predominantly to uh, countries of low and middle income. Um, you see here that the, uh, there are more than 80% of the, the, the germplasm leaving the 11 CGIR centers is going to this large swathe of, of pink uh, representing countries in, in the developing world, um, large amounts going to Africa, um, Americas and Asia, as well as um, uh, the uh, Pacific region. And this is uh, representative of 2019, but many years uh, it looks the same. Uh, major beneficiaries of, of, of uh, major recipients of the germplasm are India, China, but uh, changing from year on year, we also have, uh, this is 2019, Sudan, Mexico, Colombia, uh, Nigeria, Peru, in the top countries uh, to receive uh, materials from the CGIR. And looking a little bit in more depth about which materials are being sent out and who they are going to, uh, the gene banks are um, the um, harbors of particularly diverse materials, um, and it is predominantly traditional land races that are being distributed, uh, materials that you, you wouldn't get in breeding collections. Um, also, wild species are increasingly being uh, requested. Uh, so you can see there that um, more than three quarters of the materials uh, leaving the gene banks are uh, wild or, or, or land races, and, and predominantly going to uh, national programs, uh, universities, and advanced research institutes. So um, this, this is materials that, that are going to uh, students and breeders and researchers, mainly for, for research. Every crop is very different, however, and uh, um, there are, um, for instance, the, the tree species are, and the forages are, are, are also frequently requested from the, the sector of NGOs and pharma organizations. Um, so, so, so it does vary a lot by crop. And the distribution is, is very intercontinental. Um, so the, the, the CG gene banks are often placed in areas of um, uh, of primary diversity. So this is CIMIT in Mexico, disseminating maize uh, to many other parts of the world, uh, the rice in the Philippines, uh, potato in Peru, um, and, and, uh, and so you go on. Um, so, so we're not just, move, we're mo not just moving uh, materials region on a regional basis, but it's crossing oceans to, to other continents where um, there are uh, important risks uh, for the spread of pests and diseases that absolutely have to be uh, taken into uh, account uh, with every uh, precaution. More details, as I mentioned earlier, can be found on the uh, website at genebanks.org. And uh, we, we do uh, publish all these results every year in our annual report. Um, so underpinning all of this is the very hard work of the, the germplasm health units. And um, they're dealing with uh, many 
different countries every year. Um, this is just an example from, from 2019. And the numbers are really extraordinarily large. So in 2019, more than 150,000 samples were analyzed by the CGIR uh, germplasm health units. Um, uh, involving nearly 600,000 diagnostic uh, reactions. Um, so that is a huge volume of materials being processed uh, through these units. And, and of course, I should emphasize um, that it's not just the um, gene banks that the uh, germplasm health units uh, serve, but also the breeding uh, and research programs of the CGIR, which are um, dis disseminating much larger numbers of uh, materials than I presented in those tables. Um, and, and of course, it's, it's not just in the process of importing and exporting material that the germplasm health units are required. It's in the process also of, uh, of maintaining the, the material. So every time um, materials are planted out in the field, for whatever reason, whether it's regeneration, or whether it is uh, for characterization, um, it, it is retested when it enters back into uh, storage. So this is a little bit of an example, it's coming from um, the cassava germplasm collection of, of the requirements on the germplasm health units in the CGIR. And you'll see here that um, not only is it a question of ensuring that uh, these cassava uh, materials are virus free, um, but there's also an important role played by the gene bank in cleaning materials through thermotherapy and increasingly other techniques um, in order to clean uh, those materials for storage. And, and um, when responding to uh, requests from countries, the germplasm health unit, of course, tailors its response according to who is the requester. So uh, each country has a very, uh, in some cases, very different uh, demands uh, based on their own risk assessments. And, and that is uh, the, the, the great thing about the germplasm health units is that they're able to respond to whatever the country uh, requests. Um, and is able to um, issue uh, phytosanitary uh, um, certificates through its liaison with its national partners, um, its national uh, phytosanitary uh, organization partners. Um, and that is how material moves around the world. So it's very easy for someone like me to sit in Germany showing these tables of numbers. Uh, but when you actually look into the details of how um, these numbers are generated, you realize how much work is, is put into it. And I can't stress enough um, how, how important uh, that is and, and how impressive it is. Um, uh, Lava would have told us in more detail, and I hope he'll get the chance when, uh, when the slides are working on his laptop, to say a little bit more about how the germplasm health units are working together under the platform. They have formed a very strong and cohesive unit, all working together towards a, a shared uh, approach, uh, certainly in terms of quality management, but also in other respects. Um, he, he did mention the six areas of uh, the components of work that they are currently organized by um, in, in their uh, community of practice, um, including uh, elements of capacity development, um, the CGIR in all of its meetings and workshops, it tries as much as possible to involve relevant uh, national partners so that they might also be part of the discussion and, and gaining from, from any training opportunities. Um, the other chief aim um, with the, the, the units uh, under the CGIR is to gain in efficiency. And so they have a target of trying to uh, increase um, the, uh, the processing of samples and, and, and decrease the, the time required uh, two process samples uh, um, across the board uh, for all of the crops that the CGIR focuses on. Um, and, and they are doing that by piloting and looking at um, potentially new uh, useful technologies. So recently there was a, an effort to invest in a, a videometer uh, training and uh, to, to see how that might help uh, improve uh, processing time. Uh, for materials in, in the, the, the crops here that are the focus of that work. 
um, and perhaps even more importantly, it's been a recent project on the use of small RNA technology um, to improve the, the throughput of, um, uh, of materials going through virus uh, detection um, of the clonal crops. Um, some serious advances have been made there that could result in a, a, a serious reduction in the time required. Currently, it's at least two years to um, ensure that uh, materials being received into uh, certain clonal collections are fully uh, um, cleaned. Um, but that could be cut down quite significantly with the use of small RNA. And I do hope that uh, you'll be talking a bit more about that so that we can hear a bit more detail on that. I'm just the messenger in this case. Um, and of course, data management is just as important as, uh, as the materials. Without knowing um, the correct identification and and uh, the needs, uh, the, the, the special characteristics of um, the accessions that are managed, uh, we are fairly lost with how to use them. Um, and that's just as important from the germplasm health units as it is for the gene banks. And so uh, both gene banks and germplasm health units are working on the same platform. This is Grin Global. It's a software that was originally developed uh, several years ago. Uh, by USDA and has been adapted for, for application on a global level. So um, the CGIR have adopted um, this software both for the gene banks and the germplasm health units. Um, that leaves me uh, to um, mention one of the most impressive um, concepts that the, the germplasm health units and LAVA personally has been investing his time in. Um, and that is the Green Pass system. Um, the aim of the Green Pass system is to ensure that all materials leaving the CGIR um, can be guaranteed to have gone through the same kind of rigor of process and thus have uh, ensure that uh, anyone who's receiving those materials can have confidence in the status, the health status of, of those materials. Um, so through negotiation with uh, partners, um, and, and with the IPPC, we are discussing the possibilities for how to put such a system into place. Um, and, and, and through that, we hope to facilitate uh, the movement of germplasm from the CGIR to uh, those countries who are requesting it. Um, so I hope we hear a bit more about that, that green pass uh, concept and, and those ideas uh, as well. Finally, a few words about how we're working under the current conditions. Um, so far, life goes on in, in the gene banks and the germplasm health units. There has been a massive reduction in the movement of germplasm this year. There have been fewer requests and there, has been, uh, there have been bottlenecks in, 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 in people being able to work. Um, however, I have to say that um, everybody's efforts have been uh, tremendous in, in, in dealing with this adversity and with putting in measures to keep staff safe, but to keep uh, things moving. Germ ba uh, gene banks cannot sleep. Uh, we have to keep uh, we have to keep processes going, particularly those um, tissue culture collections. And everybody has been working very hard to ensure that is the case. And just a little reminder for why this is so important. Um, we've had examples of other disasters this year, and that in, uh, this uh, this decade. Well, no, it was last decade. Um, uh, and that includes the, uh, the, the war in Syria, where um, a unique and very large collection of um, genetic material of, of crop diversity from the Fertile Crescent um, was managed by, the, by ICADA. Uh, very fortunately, they, they saved the material in the Svalbard uh, Global Seed Vault and have been able to re-establish the collections in Lebanon and Morocco. Um, but without that kind of confidence in, in the materials, in that they were being safe, they, they were viable, they were, um, they were healthy materials held up in the Svalbard um, and, and, and being sent back to Lebanon, Morocco, and, and now re-established in the field, uh, none of this would have been possible without uh, the collaboration of uh, the national partners and the germplasm health units. Um, similarly, in, in other parts of the world, uh, 
going through rapid changes, including through climate change that's in the fields. Um, and it's through um, the work of, of SIP and their, um, uh, their um, collaboration with local communities in Peru that they've been able to repatriate um, land races after 30 years of conservation in SIP. And uh, these people who were, were uh, much younger 30 years ago were able to um, grow again some of the varieties that they remembered from their childhood. Um, so in all cases, uh, diversity has an important role to play in our, uh, in, in, in our building of resilience in, in farming systems and in food systems. And uh, it, it is always uh, a reminder to us that um, ensuring uh, uh, healthy materials are available is, is a key part of that. Um, and so as we move forward um, under the uh, reforms of the CGIR, as it's moving to a, a more cohesive uh, one CGIR system, um, so the, the, the strong collaboration between the gene banks and the germplasm health units will also move forward, um, working together in, in one program um, and, uh, and very much as, as one system. So we look forward uh, very much to um, uh, participating in collaborative work in the future um, and to uh, uh, enjoying um, some of the benefits of, of, of the work we've been doing for the past nine years um, as we move forward. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Charlotte, for this very nice presentation. Uh, in fact, you have done an excellent job in uh, highlighting the role of germplasm health in gene banking activities and, uh, and under various scenarios. And you have given nice examples how G GHUs contribute to both in repatriating native germplasm back to the communities, how GHUs contribute to revive germplasm um, from Svalbard to the gene banks and also highlighting the future scenarios uh, for GHUs. So we really appreciate uh, this very nice presentation. Um, I'm looking for any questions from the participants. Uh, if not, um, I, will, I have one question. Uh, the international gene banks put a lot of effort on the phytosanitary, to address the phytosanitary challenges so that the germplasm that is conserved is healthy, um, to enhance uh, longevity during conservation, and also when it comes to distribution to comply with the international and national regulations. Um, can you give um, your view on the situation in the national programs? How, what is the level of importance given to phytosanitary issues in the National Gene Bank program, uh, especially in developing countries? Yeah, that, that, that is a very key question, Lava, and um, thank you for asking that. I, I, I could have mentioned more about that. Um, I can relate uh, to various experiences that the Crop Trust has had in other projects. Um, Crop Trust works with uh, national partners as well as the CGIR, um, and we, we conducted a very large uh, project funded by Bill and Melinda Gates some 10 years ago. Um, and and we, as part of that project, we uh, we were supporting the um, regeneration of materials in national gene banks um, and their safety duplication um, in international centres or uh, other host uh, gene banks. And as part of that uh, process, it became very clear to us that um, the capacity of uh, national phytosanitary agencies. Uh, was um, very limited um, in particular areas, and I, I think particularly of the Caribbean, the Pacific, uh, large parts of Africa, um, not just those areas, but, but particularly those areas where um, the, the measures that were able to be uh, implemented in terms of control were very, very limited. 
um, and that left uh, it very difficult, for instance, for any country to exchange materials with even a neighboring country. Um, and in, in the Pacific in particular, where there are different uh, demands of different um, states, it's very difficult indeed for uh, even Samoa to, to uh, share germplasm with a, a neighboring uh, country, Tonga or Fiji. Um, and, and the same is true for, for, for other regions. Um, and it's for this re reason that um, the CGIR germplasm health units are becoming something of a, of a hub um, where, where national uh, con well, countries can basically send material there in order for it then to go out to, to other neighboring countries. So, so um, it is extremely challenging and we could see that the capacity of, of uh, MPPOs was uh, in desperate need of, of, of attention and of support. Um, and, and I can see that the particularly is the case for the germplasm health units. Um, uh, since the gene banks, the national gene banks have focused a lot on the countries in which they work, um, there, is, there is perhaps less need for uh, uh, exchange um, outside. Um, nevertheless, I think um, there is a, a real interest to be able to assist the movement of materials and to be able to test them in different environments and to collaborate in projects. Um, and if that is happening on an international basis, it's absolutely essential that um, we, we try and conjure up more support for MPPOs, for the CG and, and for all of these uh, different cogs in, in the wheel to be able to function properly um, in order to be able to uh, not just uh, share resources, but also to ensure that they are safely backed up. Um, in, in several cases, particularly for the vegetatively propagated crops, uh, there were instances where countries were sending materials to uh, a CG center or to another institute, and it was very difficult for that uh, shipment to be received because of the risk of, uh, of phytosanitary, uh, the phytosanitary risk in the shipment. Um, and, and, and as you know, as everyone will know, um, any risks are generally dealt with with almost a zero tolerance and, and they are destroyed. So uh, we had instances where, where gene banks were, were in, in a particularly sad case um, in the Philippines where um, they really wanted to back up their tissue culture collection and they sent materials uh, to, to another country where it unfortunately they couldn't reach the standards that were required. Um, and their shipment was destroyed. And sadly, they had a fire in their tissue culture collection. And so their attempts to back up failed and also their, much of their collection was, was harmed by the fire. So these, these are the kinds of scenarios that we, we witnessed in that project. That was 10 years ago, but I, I do believe that uh, some of those challenges still exist uh, for, for many of, uh, of the people on this call. Um, and, and for the people that uh, that we have that we are are, are hoping to depend on, um, so so certainly can see that the capacity building is a is a massive need. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much for this uh, clarification. This is a clear challenge, um, but uh, unfortunate thing is uh, these cases are not clearly highlighted or documented, so that somebody can recognize that these are some of the issues that need to be looked after or need to be studied or invested in. Um, there has to be a way to document and bring these issues to limelight so that uh, it reaches, uh, it, it, it gets the right attention to resolve some of these uh, issues. As uh, the previous speaker mentioning about the need for holistic approach, uh, Dr. Addy Freeman was mentioning about the need for holistic approach. The phytosanitary issues, especially with regard to the the national gene banks and the, the capacity of the national phytosanitary organizations in the developing countries, it requires a complete refocus. Um, and as part of this uh, bigger approach of, of One Health and other initiatives to protect the food systems need a, a good focus on the, this, what we call as germplasm value chain, because the gene banks host the most uh, diverse material that feeds into the crop improvement pro programs, breeding, as well as the, the essential germplasms that some of the native communities depend on. So I haven't seen any 
questions coming from the floor. So, like we have just five minutes left. Um, so I just take this five minutes to uh, wrap up on the first day. I would like to once again apologize for the initial glitches with my presentation. Um, we are realizing it is some probably something to do with the heavy equipment that was attached to my computer that may have slowed down my system. The file itself is very small, but uh, it's a bit unfortunate. I will have a chance again to highlight some of these issues uh, in the week. Um, so I would like to thank all the three speakers for excellent contribution today, bringing out the very key issues and clearly highlighting the need for the attention to the plant health to improve the food systems. Uh, it's very clear, the messaging is very clear and also heartening to note that uh, there are a lot of new initiatives being focused, especially by FAO to bring in various plant health institutions together to address these global challenges. Um, so with that, we'll conclude this session and I will also remind everyone that tomorrow's session is focused on the Asia, which is going to be coordinated by the three CGR centers which are located in Asia, which is the IRI, International Rice Research Institute, ICRASAT, and ICARDA. Uh, it starts at 12.30 a.m. Indian Standard Time, that is uh, 8 a.m. Nigeria time or uh, Rome time. So please do join. All the details are available on, uh, on the website, and we will continue to uh, communicate through social media. And some people have asked for the presentations. We will put presentations after this event on the on the GHU web page that is hosted on the Gene Bank platform and probably will be mirrored across the center's uh, websites as well. Uh, so uh, there is one question, if it is not too late for Charlotte to address. Um, Charlotte, would you like to address? There is one question. I'm still here, yeah. Yeah, do you think that the conservation of breeding material is necessary and what kind of material you are conserving. This is from Ben. Um, so um, I'm presuming this is a, a the conservation of breeding material. Of course, is the is the under the direction of the breeders, um, and and they have their own collections. Um, if there is um, long term value to the materials, then uh, it does make sense to introduce them into the gene banks. Um, normally, that is. Um, decided according to an acquisition policy and sometimes there's, there's a, a committee who helps uh, decide what materials uh, to, to maintain on the long-term basis in the gene banks. Gene banks are increasingly looking at dynamic ways of curating material, so um, finding ways of keeping materials temporarily um, and that's, uh, that is uh, one of the possibilities for certain materials. If, if there is a lot of uh, use over a defined time period, it, it, it is, uh, the gene banks are looking at ways of, 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 of making uh, materials available temporarily. Um, and of course, uh, we're all very aware of the need for, for keeping purified lines and how that might um, uh, affect gene banks given uh, the, the increasing um, the, the increasing availability of, of genotypic data um, and so of course we we see that as being a need coming up as well within the gene bank so all of these things it's a it's a it's a, it's a dynamic situation um, and uh, we're, we're looking at ways of, of doing as much as we can to respond to what what users need right now um, and, and meanwhile, making sure that on the long term, it's, it's the diversity in the collection that is, is given a priority uh, for, for long term conservation. Uh, so, so it's an exciting time. Thank you very much for this nice clarification. I hope that satisfies uh, Ben. Yeah, great. So we look forward to meeting um, again tomorrow online. And today, I can tell you there are about 120 participants in this session, so which is a good beginning. We had a representation from almost uh, from all the three continents, Asia, Latin America, and, and Africa. So thank you very much for all the participants for taking part today, and uh, hope you will join again tomorrow to listen to the Asian 
situation. With this, we will leave from this meeting. Thank you.